Hello, everyone. A very, very warm welcome to this session of our Zipinar. We are, as usual, always excited to have you all um, in this uh, 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 session, which we call Zipinar, because we have tried to give the best that we can in this one hour that we ask you to spend with us. This is always um, the date and the time is always the same so that you know if you miss today, uh, it's always uh, next week. We are planning something which we're, wherein we will do more of these because uh, the, mo the most important part here is um, the awareness on a topic that the speakers are passionate about and uh, we try to let the community know about it, talk about it, and then um, we do something about it um, as well. So uh, we have two um, amazing speakers. One, uh, the first uh, speaker is from Costa Rica and uh, she will be talking about the importance of children and teenagers' mental health. Um, something very, very important right now at this time, we as parents, uh, we cannot even imagine how much uh, they need uh, this, like the parents need the awareness and then um, of course the children and the teenagers, they need the help. And if they are, everything is fine, then also how to, um, you know, help others do, uh, you know, a little bit better than uh, if you have friends, you know, friends or a friend's family, if we can reach out that helping hand, nothing like that. So we have Lihia uh, with us, uh, Hernandez, and uh, I'm not going to uh, care for the uh, middle name because I know I'll butcher it. And uh, she is an English and martial arts teacher. She has uh, began training in Taekwondo and kept training with uh, dedication. And what I hear that she has attained her be uh, black belt and she has done for her children as well. I will be very interested to know how old your children are and how did you uh, manage to do that? Um, and you know, when we can do it uh, for our children, that if the, uh, Lihia, if you could um, uh, you know, focus on that <laughs> as well. And uh, her main mission uh, after talking to her is about uh, teenagers, about children, being a teacher and uh, being, um, making a difference in the community. So uh, absolute honor to have you, Lihia, over to you. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure to be here. I'm really honored to be here. And I really thank you for this opportunity. As I say, I would say uh, my mission is to help children, to support them. And as I said before, uh, mental health is a very, very sounded uh, topic nowadays. But if you read articles and if you search through Google, you see that all the topics are regarding adults' mental health. And I'm not saying that I don't care about that. Of course, I care about that. But in our hands, our, as adults, we have in our hands the future and the, and the mental health and the physical health of children. So uh, I, my mission, since I got into LinkedIn, was starting to spread awareness about this um, essential topic. And uh, we know um, we know children's mental health is as important as physical health. And when we talk about mental health, we should know that we are talking about physical, we are talking about emotional, and we are talking also about social mental health. And sometimes I really worry because surveys uh, show that more children and young people are having mental issues than 30 years before. So just imagine how impacting is this for, for our young generations. So they say that one in six children, they are facing mental health problems. And only 75% of them, only 75% 75 of them are getting the help that they need. And I'm talking uh, that this problem is all over the world, you know, all over the world. And, and most people, I don't know that uh, if they care or not, but I don't see a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of help in this, in this case or uh, a lot of support. So we should know that these problems, uh, and I'm talking about anxiety, I'm talking about depression, sleeping disorders, even eating disorders, that is one of my favorite topics, 
to talk about uh, with adolescents. Um, eating disorders are behaviors that most of the time are a kind of response to what is happening around them. It means that they are responding to something wrong that is happening in the environment. We cannot hide that reality. We cannot hide that something is happening to them. And that is the problem. Sometimes we don't listen to children. We don't listen to adolescents. We really don't uh, show the importance that these have for them. So that is the thing. Uh, for example, when I teach, I since I start teaching, I say to myself, I will take some time to like talk with uh, the students, to listen to them, because it is not only that we are talking, but we need to listen to them. So maybe some people will say, but you are wasting your time. No, I don't waste my time. Maybe the most important part of the class is the time that I am learning about them. Uh, when I am learning about what is happening to them. So we really need to be more, more careful about all these things that are happening to them. Being a child in these times is maybe more challenging than some years before. For example, we have um, like uh, they are um, they are having a more demanding education system. And I'm not saying that children or young people, they don't have the capacity to face education. Of course not. They are very intelligent and we need to promote and to also motivate them with their talents. But education system sometimes goes beyond their childhood or their, their adolescence. They don't have time to play. They don't have time to enjoy what they are doing. So this is one problem. And the other problem we have, and the other problem we have is uh, uh, that also they, um, they had to face social media. And social media, I, I'm not saying that this is the evil of this, <laughs> this topic, of course not. If we use it, um, see right now we are using social media and we are learning from each other. So that is a good thing. But the problem with social media is the way we use it. So sometimes we face uh, cases of cyberbullying, which is not good for anyone. And also we have, uh, I have seen, for example, they, they, they believe that it won't affect them but they do multitasking. For example, they are doing some homework. They are like getting tests from the iPhone or phones. And they are also listening to the music or watching TV. So they think, no, I have the capacity to do all the things at the same time. But of course, they will, this will affect them. This will affect them. And they are, if they are not good, well guided, they will have problems in the future. I think that we... Um, families, parents, teachers, caregivers, all of us who really work with children and care about them, we need to, to be really careful, not only for educating them, for, for like setting rules or telling them what is right and what is wrong, but also we have to know about them and to search if we, we see any warning sign in any of the kids and then we can let, uh, maybe if it is a school, to let the psychology department or if it is uh, in our home, to look for the assistance that is necessary. Because fortunately now we have a lot of professional help or therapies for those kind of problems. So not only adults need help, but also children need therapies and different kind of professional help. Um, okay, Lithia, I have a question, if you don't mind, yes, uh, can I of ask? Course. In, yeah, of course. so what is the time now with the social media and everybody knowing about everything, the, all the schools having, you know, psychologists and uh, um, uh, mental health coach. Uh, so uh, a child comes up and says, you know, I have, I'm having problem uh, ha having focus in studies. So where do you uh, say that you put in your uh, advice or you know that it's it's too much of um, you know a screen time and all of that so where is the point where we can decide now she, she or he needs uh, help from outside 
or we can also help them. So with that's becoming a, a big issue because kids are like, you know, I'm having a problem. I am having uh, ADHD. They are like, uh, you know, some uh, thing is happening. Uh, or like, you know, three, four years back when my daughter was like, uh, uh, I think, six years old my older one she's one day said that i have adhd i said what what do you have she diagnosed and everything that she can you know <laughs> having uh-huh. issues she cannot uh, mm-hmm. sit in one place so I, I you know what i'm talking about she didn't even know what it is but she has but, heard from somewhere so how do you deal with that with too much knowledge the kids already have and they know that they can escape also to some extent saying that i have uh, you know attention problem focus problem and uh, then uh, you know deciding w- from where to go where Okay, I will I will answer this question as a mother because my <laughs> my uh, my son was like that. Now he is uh, 23 and he is in the university but when he was a child everyone was saying the same. So even in that time he was asking me. I I I don't know why but I cannot be still. <laughs> I cannot focus and I studied with him. And I helped him to study and to try to get concentrated in, in his studies. But everyone was saying maybe he needs some medication. Oh, so take him to a therapy or something. So you know what I did? So I, I said to him, okay, you have so much energy, so much energy. <laughs> and everyone is going to get crazy at school and here at home. So what I did is I decided to, to ask him. What kind of sport would you like to practice? So he said, I like soccer. Okay, so let's go to soccer. But then I I felt that um, there was not a lot of discipline here. So he needed to, you know, to waste more uh, energy at, outside. So then I decided, uh, say, then he said, I would like to do some martial arts. So then I said, yes, that's it. that is a good idea. He was six years old at that time and he he never stopped training until i think 16 years old so my solution (laughs) for that was that i didn't i didn't give him any medication of course if i would notice that something wrong was still happening i would look for some kind of therapy because natural natural therapy of course but i i saw the problem was solved because when we went to train, when we returned to home, <laughs> you have for sure she didn't have so much energy. She didn't. He didn't have so much energy. So I took my my uh, my daughter and my son to martial arts, and that was a very very excellent. I'm not saying that everyone needs to go to martial arts, but you can look for any kind of activity. It could be arts. It could be I don't know ballet or whatever the, the kid likes. So it was really helpful because my my son start focusing more on this his studies, and it is not because he's my son, but he was getting excellent grades, excellent grades without any kind of treatment, any kind of medication. So <clears throat> sometimes we should be careful also because people sometimes have those kind of stigma uh, in this moment that they say, "Oh, your kid needs some medication to sleep. Your kid needs some medication to stay still." Your kids need some medication to focus on what he's learning. And not always is the case. Not always is the case. So we need, really need to be very, very careful about that. I don't know if I answered your question. Absolutely. And uh, I did not put her to martial arts, but I think I'm on the right track. I can teach it online if, if you want. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I, I, and you know, that's what I decided later to start training. When they got the black belt, so I really loved that. So I started training. And then I got 10 years later, I got my black belt. But it's really, really interesting the, the discipline, the focus that they have to have there, um, the skills and abilities that they get in any sport, not only martial arts, in any sport. Sports are well, really. I- Basically, we have to be mindful of how we are channelizing that um, 
energy mm-hmm. or whatever is coming up. So uh, any other practical uh, examples since you have been, uh, uh, you know, dealing with children. So if you can just, you know, say something which, uh, you know, here attendees, I they mean, can, yeah, uh, I, yeah. I, I, anything uh, had re- significantly changed, you know. Oh, yes, yes. I, I have an experience that I would like to share right now. Uh, I have a student. Um, this student was coming for tutoring classes and he was, uh, I think, in first grade, but he has some behavior problems. So I was really scared because he had a like, uh, very, very bad uh, background at school. All the teachers, they didn't want to teach him. And one time I remember I was going outside because I have a, a, a class here at home. So I was going outside to open the door and I saw him, he was kicking his mother. So I said to myself, oh my God, what is happening here? I can I can forget that student because that student changed uh, my whole life. I remember that all the moms that were coming here, they always say, if you uh, if you are teaching that guy, we are not taking our our kids to your place because we don't want them to be with him. So I say, no, no, that is not fair. We should need first what is happening to this kid. Of course, I was not, not, uh, I mean, I didn't agree with what ha- was happening with him, but in his behavior. So I talked to his mom and to his uh, grandmother. And then I said, uh, what do you take him to, to see some specialist or something? So they discovered that this kid has a, uh, a very hard problem, but it, it, it was a very chronic problem. It wasn't, it was not only a psychological problem, but he, he really have, he really need not only therapy, but he, he also needed uh, some medication. So uh, it was not really easy because I said to the other moms, I'm sorry, but if you want to be here, I won't let anyone to, you know, to to be like that kind of behavior with other kids because we need to understand all of them. Fortunately, later the moms understood and all the kids were coming here and they get together and this kid really had really had a very, very, very positive change. I can't forget this kid because, uh, but this time this kid now is in the university also. And sometimes he come home, he comes home and he, he always say, Thank you so much, uh, teacher, because you helped me a lot. Um, uh, my pro- the problem I have when I was a kid, it was a pathological problem. It was really hard for me to handle, but now I feel better. So now he is not taking any medication. He's not taking any kind of therapy, and he's a professional in computer. And, and you know, uh, most uh, of the things that he's grateful for is that he says that I didn't let others to take him apart from the class. And I really love him because he is always, as I said before, coming here and saying, thank you, thank you so much. Um, thank you so much, teacher, because you changed my life. You changed my family life also because it was it was terrible. Even at school, they were uh, saying that they wouldn't have to take him to another school because of the behavior problems. And we got along each other very well. And he even got along very well with my kids because my kids were here also. And the change, it was amazing. It was really amazing. That was one of my favorite experiences that I, I like to share. And that's, you know, something, that's what I always say. Before you judge children, you, you, you need to ask several questions to yourself. Ask yourself, um, do these children are getting enough attention? Do these kids are being really listened? Do these kids are really uh, receiving respect and love? So we we cannot judge children. I don't know if this uh, if this also answers your your question. Yeah, of course. I mean, uh, yeah, that's an example, and that's um, how the awareness goes um, all over. You know, it's not only one child or. Um, uh, the family is also involved. And, yeah, and you mentioned something very important. Uh, I I wrote something also about mindfulness. Uh, I was searching about that because in most schools, you know, I don't know if you have noticed, and I don't know in your country, but there are countries who 
uh, they include subjects that are not really so uh, maybe so important for children. I'm not saying that that so <laughs> that only some of them are important, but <clears throat> I always believe, sorry, that some uh, something that will be very very useful for children it will be a subject called mindfulness or even uh, the practice in yoga or something like that. If children learn that, if parents are aware about how how amazing is mindfulness, practicing mindfulness for children, it will be a complete difference, a complete difference. Really, I think that if, if, if mindfulness help us as adults, just see the, the wonders that it can do with, with children. It will be really amazing. So I, I that's, that's, that is one of my ideas. I really want to promote that, the idea that mindfulness should be uh, really, uh, there are some schools, for example, in Australia, um, and they are uh, setting this kind of uh, practice, mindfulness, but I think that it should be like uh, something more general, something that really could uh, transform education in, in all the schools. I don't know what you think about that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, nothing more than that. Um, uh, and as uh, parents, as uh, grandparents, everybody's uh, influence, I think, has a major issue uh, impact on the children. So uh, if you can uh, just, you know, summarize, if you can, um, and definitely anybody can ask any other question, but uh, since I have to leave, just wanted to get from you, what are the steps? Like for, you know, mostly uh, parents have difficulties with teenagers. Um, so what are the like sort of a bullet point thing that we have to keep in mind that, uh, you know, everybody here can take away from this uh, uh, webinar that uh, what we should look out for and uh, what are the precautions we should take and what is important right now for the uh, teenagers, especially and children, if you could highlight on that. Please. Of course, of course, not only now, but I think all the time, uh, all the time, what well, we should be uh, really um, care, uh, careful about is le remembering that uh, all of us were in that stage. I mean, every stage of our life has different challenges. And, you know, adolescence is a very difficult time. We all know that. But the problem is we sometimes don't do anything. I mean, we don't look for the, for, for the answers or for the ways to about adolescence. So what I think is uh, we should remember, for example, one of the things that we should um, care about adolescents is that they, 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 they have problems with the changes that they are facing during that time. So they look for other kind of help. They look for other kind of help like substances or something. And these substances or these uh, friendships that are not good for them, are going to bring him, bring them uh, mental health problems. So we, we should be aware of that. The most we care about their mental health because it will depend the future, it will depend that they will be well-rounded and healthier adults and it's all our responsibility. What we can do, and maybe everyone will say, but you are, you are uh, just talking, but it is so easy to say, but no, it is easy. And it is not only easy, but it is cheap to do. Children need to be loved, trust, listen, understood. And not only children, but adolescents, of course. If they feel all that love, trust, understood, and listen, if they have the appropriate time, quality time, because I know that everyone is very busy now, quality time with them. If they have that attention, we can avoid and prevent so many, many, many problems. So many problems and things will, wouldn't be so complicated because this is what they really know. What they really need is love, being loved, being, being a feeling that they are really, really uh, important in their families or at school. We need to be more compassionate with children and young people. We, I, that's what I really think. Uh, I'm not saying that we have to take all the time and because I understand most parents are working, but we need to take that time, that quality time for them. And if, if we need some kind of professional assistance, so we can look for it or we can search and add someone. 
But that's that's the most important thing. I, I I I'm not saying because someone said to me, but we can avoid we can avoid problems in life. No, we can avoid problems in life. They're going to face tough times as as we have gone through. But if they we give them the tools, the appropriate tools to face those problems, the future will be so different and and a healthier life will be um, suitable for them. That's what I think. Fantastic. Uh, thank you so much for highlighting those, uh, Leah. And uh, there is a question. Uh, would you like to answer live? So this is from Srujan Aparna. So how should we plan their day or activities in summer? Uh, leave them to enjoy or care about the activities and schedule. What activities to do, play, or interested in them? Also, they learn something useful to them. Mm -hmm. I think that we should give them the chance to be children to be young people also so during summer uh, even during we have for example here during any season but during winter or whatever season we need we need to teach them how to schedule their time to take advantage of time but they are not robots and they are not machines so we need to give them chance to to look for the activities that they really want if they like to draw so let's take time to draw if they want to to spend time with uh, the friends, let, let them have that space with the friends. Of course, that is another point. We need to, to care about the, their friends. We need to pay attention to get involved in, in the process. That is not uh, that, that we say, okay, go outside and play. No, no, they, they, we need to care about them. We need to pay attention to them. We are not uh, like you, you, you have a pet and you say, go outside to play. No. No, they, we really need to be vigilant to what they are doing and see if they are really enjoying, uh, if they are in any kind of sport. Because as I say before, one of the things that I really recommend is sports. Sports or... I can see the question right now. <laughs> they are asking about video games. Oh my goodness. I know about that. I know about that. And you know, uh, I'm not saying that they cannot play video games or they cannot um, uh, all use those things. But what we need to do is to set limits to the time that they use those video games. Because there are people, and uh, we should be honest with this, there are adults who take video games as, as the caregiver or as the babysitter. Okay, please go and watch videos while I am working. So they don't care about that. We should set limits. We should set limits. Because one of the things that I learned, and especially with my son, was that he really liked video games. But now that he's an adult, he says, Thank you, mom, that you didn't let me, <laughs> you didn't let me spend so much time on that. Because I know if, if I gave him the chance to spend all the time that he wanted, he couldn't focus on his studies. So we also need to pay attention to how are they going and set the limits for the time. I mean, we are in charge. So we are the ones who, who need to set the limits. I hope that take care uh, that takes care of the uh, query, uh, Surgeon. Um, any other uh, person would like to open their mic, uh, share insights, and also ask questions to Leah? Yes, hi. This is Sheetal. That was a very good talk. Thank you so much, and it made me also think about you know the the video games and uh, engaging the children because as adults, most of us. Um, are really, really, really occupied, even if you're present in the room or in the house, but we are on uh, Zoom calls and, uh, you know, can't monitor kids. And uh, that's a, a very good skill for them to have to slowly develop that self-parenting, which, like you said, variety, 
um, that they are not robots and they will not. And as adults, we don't self-parent ourselves all the time. So one of the things that I have used in the past is um, something, especially during summer, is called pecans and rice. I picked up somewhere from some other teacher. I don't remember. But pecans and rice, like I would I have the kids write, write a list in the under the column pecans. Pecans are, I think, responsibilities. Yes. So, you know, if that if I want them writing, if I want them doing some Khan Academy or any kind of academic stuff, uh-huh. yoga, uh-huh. meditation, all that stuff comes under pecans. And then rice comes under entertainment, whatever they want to do, like play games or um, go outside, go to the park, whatever, whatever they thought was fun. So one of the analogies is that you fill a jar with pecans first and then rice also comes in. But if you put the rice first, there is no space for pecans because rice can go in between the spaces, right? Mm -hmm. So that analogy really helped with them. Uh, But I was kinder. I told him we could do pecan, rice, pecan, rice. So when they're whiling away, I would say, are you doing a pecan or a rice? It was a very cryptic way. (laughs) That made them check themselves. But it that is, is not an easy task. Yes, I agree. Yes, that is really. And those habits, those habits of being organized, uh, and discipline, they get uh, these habits during those times. So we set these uh, habits during childhood. It will be easier for them to handle that when when they are adolescents or when they are adults. Right. Yes. True. <laughs> Uh, and one of the things I'm doing with my 10 year old right now is to have magnets. I've seen this and I forget the name of this kind of project management that they do in corporate America. And uh, I, I forget the name, it starts with A, uh, some kind of time management for projects where uh, the manager de- takes one look at this, uh, this app or something where they see, so they know they have a list of say, for example, 10 tasks to get the project done in four months. So at a glance, it tells the manager um, which ones are in, have started, which ones are in progress and which ones are completed. So there's three columns. So Mm -hmm. I create this Mm -hmm. magnet where one is, could be our native language, one could be piano, one could be, uh, this is only um, pecans. This is only, you know, good stuff. So then there would be like six different magnets that they would have to work on every day. So when I look at it, I will have to see if it's in the middle, that means is it in progress or some are done, or at the end of the day, they're all in yet to be started. <laughs> I'm trying different experiments. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. That, that, that means that you are getting involved in the process. And that is amazing. And that they won't forget that. They won't forget that. You have for sure that. So thank you so much for uh, your contribution to the world. And I completely am with you. Thank you uh, so much. And teens and their mental health, even though as parents, we have the best interest in mind, we could be their worst, honestly, in some situations, enemies. You know, yes, that, that is true. <laughs> right. So, thank you so much for sharing your experience. It's really, really amazing. Thank you so much. That's really a wonderful talk and really timely, like uh, with the changes right now in the environment and uh, for, for, for the children and adolescents, it's, it's kind of tough for them too. And uh, for those uh, parents and parents-to-be and also for those who are still living with their parents, this talk is really wonderful. You can review this one if you missed uh, in our uh, YouTube uh, channel, Let Us Talk It. And if you wish to interact with uh, Lia offline, uh, you can add her on LinkedIn. She's very approachable and uh, responds instantly. And if you wish to get her contact, you can get in touch with the Let Us Talk It team. Thank you so much. And we can move to the next topic for today. So uh, let me introduce you uh, about what business leaders need to know about Web3 and Metaverse. So this is the next section of uh, today's talk. And this will be provided by Madhu Sudan Madi Anand, and, uh, which is a co-founder, a data scientist, and CTO at Ambi. So this is an overview of Web3 and the metaverse for business leaders. Learn where it stands in the technology and business space and know about the fundamental principles and concepts. And about the speaker, uh, he's a passionate problem uh, 
solver, data scientist, customer obsessed product manager. He builds products from conceptualization to prototyping and all the way to making it revenue generating while ensuring the product culture and team skills. So he has won five national level awards in the startup ecosystem for building products on IoT, ML, and AI, internet, digital, and mobile. So here to present as a topic, uh, Madhu Sudan or Madi, please take over. Thanks, that was a little overwhelming, but thank you. Um, I've got a completely different topic um, and, and Ligia did a great job um, in explaining a very critical topic. Uh, mine isn't that interesting uh, anyway, but uh, definitely is uh, uh, something that we'll all be using and working on. So I'm glad, thanks for inviting me for this uh, talk. I've prepared a small presentation um, and if uh, it's okay, I can share my screen. Yes, please, please go ahead. Okay. Um, yes, is it is. Visible? Okay, uh, great. Uh, so I'll, I'll jump right into it. So in the same way, you know, um, you all are internet users, you've joined on this call. That means you're definitely active internet users, no doubt about that. So in the same way, social media, e-commerce, and even the internet itself were once seen as passing fads, but they all ended up revolutionizing the way companies do business, right? So Web3 and Metaverse are building full-fledged economies of goods and services that are already changing the way we humans interact with the digital world. So this I'm targeting mostly to upcoming business leaders on, on, on the audience or existing or future, uh, or future or existing business leaders to, who need to understand that the changing expectations of uh, your consumers or of the workforce or your organization, or it, it, it could even be your own career and you could recognize what new capabilities and markets these technologies are opening. So in this course, um, I'm going to be, sorry, in this session, I'm going to be talking about uh, just the fundamentals of Web3 and Metaverse. Um, and um, uh, my name is, once again, for those who joined late, is Madhusudan. Um, and um, I'm using Web3 and Metaverse to build a digital twin uh, of our planet Earth uh, to solve some of the deepest problems like climate change. So more on that later, but let, let me move to uh, just quickly discuss what we are going to cover. So we're gonna cover what Web3 is, how the metaverse can affect your career, your business. I'll touch very slightly on the career because it's a very deeper topic and, and two topics would not allow me in 30 minutes. So I'll stick to business. And how do you lead uh, in the era of Web3 and what are the things you should change uh, conclusion and we look for some question answers. But in, in, you know, feel free to interrupt in between if you suddenly run into a pressing topic, okay. So let's quickly jump right into the introduction of uh, Web3. So like I said, you know, um, some time ago, all of us were used to going to a shop and buying your mobile phone or buying your favorite pair of jeans, right? So, uh, but certain things change now. So in the same way we would go to individual's house to meet people and some things change now, we don't meet as many people physically as me, we meet as digitally, right? For this call, for example. So in the same way, this whole social media, e-commerce, and even the internet itself were once seen as these kind of passing fads. It has evolved a lot into, uh, you know, uh, creating of a new technology, right? So that is, that is how, uh, uh, you know, this whole thing has started. So you could suddenly go online and look up information. So when it all started in the 1960s, um, some sort of a network that came in and in 1970s, it evolved from a PC to multiple PCs. In 1980, you could send emails uh, within a single network. And that's when the internet word was coined. And in the 1990s, um, uh, people started serving HT, uh, static web pages. Right. So what is it? So in Web 1.0 came into picture in the 1990s. What it meant was a company could showcase static web pages to their users, uh, to their customers, while they controlled all the information. And Web 2.0 changed that, where it made it interactive. So even you could give information, share information back into it. And Web 3.0 
uh, is something that is going to, um, sorry, just a slide is stuck, okay. And, and you know, Web 2.0, blog, microblogging, social networking, podcasting, a little bit more on this is uh, um, here. So you, all these brands came in, uh, Meta, Spotify, you could listen to music, you could create music, upload music, videos, you could host servers, you could run your applications, a whole lot of things changed. The e-commerce companies became more powerful, they could, uh, you know, you, you could buy and sell anything today online. So that's how you connect with digital to the world, make a request, you make a digital payment, a physical object appears in front of your doorstep, you can start using it. Web3, on the other hand, it's all about connecting people. You know, it was, if Web2.0 was all about connecting people, Web3.0 is all about connecting people with things. Everything that is in the digital world, physical world should be available in the digital world. So people, places, and things connecting all of it in a decentralized way is what uh, 3.0 is. Uh, I, you know, I've got some technical terms like semantic search and all of it, but that's for perhaps uh, another time. So this is how uh, you know the evolution of the web happened. Once again, um, there is Ethereum and Bitcoin uh, kind of things came in, but we're going to talk about uh, it as we go. Um, so the most important things that you need to know are one um, that Web 3.0 is. It's also called Web 3. Sometimes call it Web 3.0. Is that it's built on blockchain technology. Two, it emphasizes decentralization a greater individual ownership of digital assets. And three, there are many but different visions on how it will operate, operate. I like to think that you're here because you want to understand and be a part of building that future. So let's start with the foundational understanding of it. First principle of Web3 is blockchain. Um, now, uh, you know, a blockchain is nothing but a shared database that links data in blocks and that cannot be edited. Now, this creates an irreversible timeline of data, allowing you to see when and where any piece of data can be created or stored at any given moment. Another important feature of blockchain is that it's a distributed ledger, meaning the same information is stored in multiple places within a network. Whenever information is entered on blockchain, it is recorded across the entire network, which brings us to the second principle, decentralization. Now, by its nature, the blockchain is decentralized. That means there is no central server or a company that controls or owns the data. You're all LinkedIn users, right? So when you log into LinkedIn, all your information is owned and stored in the LinkedIn server. But when it comes to you know, decentralization, it's different from what we have now. In our Web 2.0 world, any information about how we use the internet or any information we put on the internet is stored by the company that provides the platform we used, right? So when you want to access the data on LinkedIn, you have to log into your account and request see it. While LinkedIn user agreement makes it clear that you own your personal data on their service, not every company operates this way. Some companies, as we know, will retain your, the rights to your photos, your posts or package and sell all of your data to third parties. So in the web three world, this, is not, this does not happen. You control, you have more control and ownership over the data you use because you've got direct access to blockchain you're stored on. Instead of companies collecting and monetizing your personal data, you could monetize your data yourself. You could actually own the digital assets you purchased or earned on blockchain. For example, you know, uh, for our web 2.0, minds that we all have. It might be hard to imagine how this whole thing will work. This is exactly how, you know, when some when the first e-commerce companies came, you, people did not want to order their t-shirt online without having to try it themselves. People did not, you know, users were critic, critic about making purchases online. But look at what happened later. The same way people would not be happy talking about their, on, you know, updating their details on social media, but look at what's happening today. Right? So even among current visionaries, there are different opinions of what the future of Web 3.0 could look like at this point in time, but some people hope for fully decentralized social media communities and economies based on the blockchain that are 
managed by the community of users, not by a single company. Now, some users are actually building artificial intelligence systems like us that allow computers to function beyond responding to commands from a centralized server and even understand human language. Some call it Web 3.0, others call it Web 3. For now, just recognize that internet is shifting towards decentralization. This is happening right now as we speak and individual control and ownership of data. So at the end of this video, uh, right now, um, sorry, end of this particular slide right now, you should ask yourselves, you know, what could that mean for you, for your career, for your business? And how does that change your relationship with some other tools? And then we'll, let's look at um, metaverse. Okay, right after this, sorry, I missed to move the slides. So let's talk about, let's understand, we've heard this term a lot, uh, metaverse, if you haven't heard it, uh, it's a very interesting concept. There are so many definitions of the metaverse and, and we know what it is and what it can become. But on a basic level, the metaverse involves the internet breaking free from the, you know, the tiny rectangles and phones and tablets from our hands and our desks. It's a convergence of our physical and digital lives. And before we go further, I'll also address one more misconception um, that metaverse is not a single platform. Okay, it's not owned by any company. It can be more helpful to think of it as a way we'll experience the internet in the future, enabled by many different technologies. We'll talk about what technologies enable them. But to envision this metaverse right now, try to think of it um, entering metaverse like going to an old fashioned shopping mall. You know, remember those malls in the older time, earlier times, the supermarkets? But there are many different stores you could go in and you could freely walk into one another. And you can even choose from the range of experiences available there. So everyone will experience the mall in a different way. Now, probably you know how to get to your closest mall, but how do you know, how do you get to the metaverse, right? Many people hear the word metaverse immediately and think of virtual reality or VR for good reason. VR systems actually immerse us in fully digital worlds. It really feels like you're in a different universe like those gaming consoles that you wear Oculus and you know you play those games if you're. But virtual reality is just one of the many ways to enter the metaverse. Like there are many doors into the mall. Another metaverse entry point, um, another metaverse entry point is uh, like called augmented reality. And this overlays physical world with digital world of visual, auditory and other sensory information. There are even seven dimensional approach taken into this. So maybe you've seen those AR glasses, right? Or use an AR app on your phone, even interacting with artificial intelligence, talking to an automated uh, you know, um, avatar online of, for customer care uh, within a VR AR system, or could be a chatbot on your desktop contributes to this feeling of immersion. Now, ever bought your glasses online uh, where you, without having to try it? So they ever tried come across, uh, in India, there's this company called LensCart, you could try on those 3D glasses, put on those on your own face without having to visit the store. It digitally gives you a picture of what you would look like when you're wearing those glasses, right? So let's talk about uh, some of the potential futures that Met Metaverse has to offer. I think there are fascinating opportunities to develop this technology and experiences in the boundaries between our physical and digital lives. So to simply put, Metaverse takes physical everything that is and takes it into a digital world. So you could you know, um, talk to people, you can interact and, and you could do things. Um, and and, and in, you, know, you could, many Metaverse technologies are going to be incorporated, your physical movements and human inputs to build a seamless physical digital experience. Now this can have massive implications for business and brands. I'm also interested in the way the Metaverse allows people to develop and explore identities in a new way. You don't enter the metaverse as an invisible entity, just to observe. You enter the metaverse to do things with other people. It's not free for all Facebook kind of thing, but it's a lot more controlled but with, and, and with a cause. And it's also free from the constraints and barriers that exist in the free world. You have to get to a place, you have to catch a train or go through traffic, go through a whole lot of things to meet 10 different people. But on the metaverse, you don't have to do that. All you need is uh, you know, a, a one of the devices that augments it. it. Could even be a PC. 
or it could even be a, just a glass that AR will fit into. So uh, we're still largely approaching the metaverse from a web 2.0 mindset. You know, whatever, everything that I'm saying may not even be making a lot of sense, but big companies are building virtual reality platforms, virtual worlds that we access to play and interact on. But what if those were, worlds were built and shared by a community of users? What if you purchased a digital item, you can use it across multiple platforms? What if you and your experiences had some hand in shaping the world around you? This is one vision. Even if the metaverse isn't fully decentralized, it's, it will still expand human experience, commerce and orientation towards the digital world. Now, as a business leader, yeah, I think I'm not going in sync with the slides, but anyway, slides don't matter. I hope I'm, I, I've got your attention. Anyway, as a business leader or, or as someone who's learning about this or hearing about these new technology first time, even if they seem far-fetched or sci-fi right now, it could open up new markets. It could expand your customer base and it could change the way you support and interact or build your uh, career and redefine your own personal brand or your company's brand. Consider that vision and you will see that the possibilities are limitless. Okay. So once again, um, yeah. So let's talk about uh, some of the, you know, technologies uh, that we just covered. Uh, just a moment. Great. So let's also look like uh, how it currently looks like, and what are some of the, you know, um, the technologies that exist. So and how we can take a, a advantage. So we discussed about AR, VR, AI. Uh, how AI combines some of the computer science and uh, extensively sets to enable computers to perform some of the activities that human brain does. So uh, we have a baseline understanding of what metaverse is. And let's try to visualize how your career or your business might fit in. The metaverse market offers a huge opportunity to those who like to take advantage of it. If you're a budding product manager, programmer, someone who's like to sell something or someone who's even, even the use case where you want to interact with students, hundreds of them one-on-one -on -one, without having to go to all the schools and explain the importance of mental education, um, um, mental health education, you could reach out to them through Metaverse straight away. And you could have a replica of uh, hundreds and thousands of yourself of, of Ligia, for example, in the metaverse, <laughs> in, available in this premises of the metaverse of that school. And every student who's got a problem, they could go straight away, talk to, uh, talk to her. And she's got a set of AI, you know, which machines that can think to handle to certain, some of the queries that parents and children have alike. And also perhaps keep a watch of certain things that are going on. If someone's suffering, someone's you know, teacher can enable the student if who's going through certain things to open up certain questions, just like a confession that you're making to a computer with a privacy, your information that you discuss, everything is safe. And when that safety is created, a metaverse use case is directly applicable. So, and, and most of us, you know, for many people, the introduction of metaverse will be through gaming. So this makes sense as a gaming platforms have a long history of building complex virtual worlds to draw in and entertain users. An interesting development in metaverse gaming though, is that games are expanding beyond the usual compete and complete objectives. Instead, gaming is becoming synonymous with having fun with other people. Just like in the physical world, hanging out with friends could mean playing boards, watching TV, going shopping, or just sitting around and chatting. Metaverse gaming includes playing competitive games educating yourself, building virtual environments, consuming ent entertainment and socializing. In fact, younger generations, my, my, my seven-year-old son, in fact, plays this uh, game on Roblox. Roblox is a metaverse platform for gaming. And they're increasingly, many, of, many people, many children are turning into gaming platforms instead of traditional social media channels to connect with their friends. The fashion industry is another segment that we just you know, spoke of is fully embracing the metaverse for a good reason. From Nike to Adidas, from sports brands to, to Gucci, everyone um, are, are um, you know, where there are no limits on design and what the human body can wear. 
So people can express their own real self by wearing what they really would love to wear in the real world, but in the physical world, I mean, in the digital world or the virtual world, because there are no limits and every avatar needs to wear clothes or there are already a lot of games like this. I know my wife plays one where she's got a dog, she's got a, you know, she's, she attends parties, she's, she's got this dresses she can purchase, wear and, you know, network socially with real people. Uh, who, are, who are in the virtual world. So um, I touched on this uh, topic where uh, we, we talk about the lens card thing, but identity and ownership within the metaverse are becoming increasingly important. Speaking for myself, I know most of my uh, physical world fashion choices are based on comfort, convenience, compliance, and social norms. But I'm really excited by the possibilities in the metaverse of wearing clothing that truly expresses my unique identity. Additionally, the fact that metaverse is still new and it's being built means there's a lot of room for developing cultures and new norms. Entering this world virtually gives everyone an opportunity to experiment, ultimately brand themselves with an identity of their own creation. So if you don't work in retail or entertainment, you might not even be related, you might be thinking the metaverse is not for me. But the fact is metaverse opportunities offers for all businesses. You name a business, I will draw a parallel to you and tell you how metaverse is coming to you uh, in terms of technology. Think of it as a simply new environment for your business to exist in, for your career to make use of. For now, reflect you know, and, and, and just go through some of the items and we'll cover and talk about some important topics like the NFTs and uh, so on. Um, I'll just quickly pause. It's been very quiet. <laughs> so either I'm not going fine or too fast or is, is there are there any questions any reactions is it done okay everything just fine for me yes uh, yeah we have here uh, Sheetal, amazing talk well, that's great okay uh, all right great i'll continue hey madhu uh, uh, just a question here uh, okay. so uh, with this technology uh, in the current situation uh, is there anything i can uh, you know uh, feel and uh, you know look and feel i have a, you know uh, oculus but uh, i have only limited option to play in that but if you have anything examples maybe that will be helpful to you know relate to whatever you are explaining yeah, absolutely. I mean, there is an app called Loka, L-O-K-A. They were mm -hmm. recent on Shark Tank. Mm -hmm. Okay, the founder, Krishnan, is a very good friend of mine. Okay. He's built this app. You can explore and shop around uh, in Delhi's Connaught Place without having to go to Delhi or to Connaught Place and all on your mobile or on your, on your tab. Mm -hmm. um, there is uh, there's a company called Design Cafe they actually build your whole house and including interiors, exteriors, and give you an Oculus uh, experience of walking into your own house, how it mm -hmm. will be when it is fully built when, with their new design. Now it's called Design mm -hmm. Cafe. So, design. so I mean, uh, yeah, there is a, a banking experience that uh, Citibank has created. Mm -hmm. You can walk into a virtual bank and do your actual banking and talk to a, a metaverse banker and, and, you know, if you could fill in a form uh, by just talking mm -hmm. and for details and interact with them and even make your digital signature apply for, for a loan or, or pay your mm -hmm. credit card bill or withdraw even money or, or make a transfer to another account. Okay. So, okay. I mean, there are plenty. I mean, I can, I can go on, um, but I, I hope you, you got the picture. Yeah, I got it. I got it. So let me, yeah, explore more on this. Yeah, please continue. Yeah. Great. Thank you. So, um, yeah, so let's, you know, uh, there are a lot of new markets that are, that are coming in, um, in, in this, uh, area, just a moment. I just, uh, second. okay. So we talk about something called as NFTs. I, my mouse suddenly lost Bluetooth, so I couldn't change. Um, all right. So there's something called as NFT. We'll get to it, get to this in a bit. Okay. Now, uh, we appreciate, we need to appreciate real value of certain things in the digital world. 
it shouldn't come as a surprise, but people buy digital goods for most of the same reasons they buy physical goods. A, a product fills a need, right? It, it seems fun or even communicates something about the buyer. Though you cannot physically handle digital assets, they do hold value to those who purchase them. Whether you're interested in creating and selling digital goods, investing in them or implementing them in your business, it's important that you understand the context of what gives these goods their value. First, let's look at the digital asset utility, right? How can it, an, an item be used or what benefit does it provide? A trend to be aware of is that Metaverse customers show more interest in collecting than consuming. So there is this thing called um, N NFT, which are especially they lend themselves to collective, collectively as each NFT has unique properties. In the physical world, it can be difficult to differentiate between a luxury purse and a well-made replica. But within the NFT, the authenticity is right there in the publicly available code. For example, you know, you purchase music, um, but when you purchase music, you only purchase a copy of that music, not the rights for reselling that music. But NFTs, on the other hand, is something that uh, own the reselling rights of that particular um, music. So, you know, so this is what is happening increasingly. This opens opportunities to build layers of utility into digital assets. The utility of gaming used to be in its entertainment value. However, a lot of online games now have a social aspect and a growing number of play to earn models where individuals can win digital assets and, and even earn money. They can use these assets within the game economy and some, some instances they can even earn real money. The utility of you know, there's Pokemon Go, you could trade Pokemon for real money. So uh, the utility of a digital asset will expand if it can be used in, in different, different ways across different platforms which brings me to the point called interoperability. It's a big concept if you're technically learning it, but uh, for the metaverse to operate as envision, people need to move seamlessly across different platforms. Ideally, the goods you purchased in any given form, uh, platform will be able to travel with you, digital fashion marketplace, for example, and, and this dematerialized sells NFT clothing that could be displayed or worn in AR in some cases. So these are called non-fungible tokens. And this is one step towards transportability authentication. So the NFTs are unique digital representation of assets. They exist on blockchain. And when you purchase NFT, you're purchasing the digital token that exists on the blockchain. And you can display, transfer, and sell that NFT. You could purchase land in Scotland, for example. You could build a castle on it. And you could sell it as you would sell another a land, a piece of land. And these things appreciate value the same way physical uh, land appreciates in value, right? And and we'll have to see, you know, whether this level of buying and selling continues in the future, or more moves towards something else, or or individuals have some kind of different options. But finally, these digital products are today giving physical value to physical counterparts. There's a lot of things going on. A lot of people say this is um, not important, but there are certain other corporate ex uses as well. And because there, there's so much transparency and permanence of the data, it makes it a great solution for um, fields that deal with logistics, supply chain, and counterfeiting, right? It's already in place if you are, uh, there's a supply blockchain and supply chain uh, are working very close together. And there are plenty of NFTs, documents, ledgers that are signed. And, and then there are uh, other technologies like cloud computing that allows companies um, uh, along with, now we saw AR, VR, AI, um, and, and there's also something you, know, you might have known called edge computing. Edge computing is where a machine, a device, a physical device learns more about you and, and does certain things. Like for example, there's this uh, air conditioner that knows your preferred temperature and it sets it when you are, when it knows, it sets it to that temperature when it knows you're in the room. It's a home automation uh, by Snyder, uh, Snyder Electric. Then on your smartphone, if you have iPhone, it's got a profile that understands when you sleep, when you wake up, it shuts down into a silent mode uh, when you're, when there's a wind down time approaching, right? So, and then there are other technologies like 5G networks, Wi-Fi, NB-IoT, LoRaWAN, all of these are connectivity. Uh, solutions. They make different devices and computers talk to each other to provide you, to collectively provide you information 
real time when you're in the metaverse, right? So let's look at how uh, metaverse can affect your business. Um, so if you have to run a successful metaverse business, you have to, or, you know, look at joining a business that's running, you have to encourage social interaction. Businesses that encourage social interaction with their customers, um, you, you know, they, you, you could see there's this Nike run application. Many of you might be using it. Very soon you will see an update where you could virtually make friends, run with them in real, for real, okay? And when you do that in metaverse points, you get to enter and, and showcase your run with other runners, right? Uh, you could, should promote creativity because there are a lot of digital assets that could be sold and bought. And you could emph emphasize the unique individual. No matter how he is, you cannot categorize him or her into a, a set of rules or a set of conditions. So, yeah. Um, let's think about certain, some of the questions um, at this point of time. How would having access to virtual world change your relationship with your customers? And how would it change your relationship with your employees? And, you, and, and what new experiences and customer journeys could you provide? How this metaverse could be relevant to your mission as to whatever you're after? How would it come to your children tomorrow? If, it, if you're talking about children today, they will be the primary users, just like how you guys, we guys of this generation were primary users of mobile phone technology, which some of our you know, parents 20 years ago had no clue, well, not more, maybe 30 years ago now, did not know a phone could freely be held in the hand in the pocket, could not even imagine certain things. You could be on the side today sitting, you know, certain things that are happening today, you would see your children using it firsthand. So how could some of these things and experiences could impact your own um, personal and professional career? And what brand identity would you like to present if you are a part of the business or thinking about your organization in the virtual world? Or it could even be yourself as a person uh, out to do something. And it's it's just beginning and there's a whole lot of things we could uh, we could capitalize. Okay, so um, let's also look at, uh, we just discussed NFT authenticity and uh, interoperability about uh, certain things. Take a look at this website called the dematerialize.com. Um, this website lists out a lot of these digital assets that you could own today uh, as your own. You don't own the intellectual property of these rights, but of these products, but you own everything else and you have the right to resell it. Okay. And as this you know, metaverse becomes more and more connected, it will be important that products can move easily between different platforms. Um, and yes, um, yeah, what are the um, assets utility? When you do visit this website, take a look at what are the assets utility? Do not purchase straight away uh, or anyone tries to sell you an NFT in the future. Think about its utility, where can it be used? What are you getting when you purchase it? And how does the digital asset differ from its physical counterpart? Okay, so um, now you may already be excited about expanding into new markets, but what if uh, I told you that metaverse is opening up whole new economies? These technologies are changing as we know it. Billions of people play online games and spend money within these virtual worlds. It's so much so big that it's crossed a, a couple of hundred billion dollars in terms of revenue as to how much of money has been made by these companies in the virtual worlds. And in most games, you can get started in the virtual economy by completing tasks and earn in-game currency or buy in-game currency with real money. Uh, you know, there are a ton of games. I can, I can give a list of, uh, I just shared a couple of them as a list, but there are, there is uh, uh, this, this famous game, uh, you even you can take it uh, Call of Duty, for example. And um, there's some online games have started to build out complex virtual economies that affect the real world. And another business model, uh, for example, Pokemon makes you walk search in the virtual world. It was one of the first um, metaverse applications that makes you go for a walk. And by the time you collect two Pokemon, you would have done more than 10,000 steps, right? 
So, in, in, you know, this is increasingly grow as younger generations are more and more interested um, in, in, in this virtual environment and new customer journeys and touch points are being created as we speak. Even if you're not ready to sell in the metaverse, you may still be interested in the web economy being built around the cryptocurrency. And there are far more um, you know, components for us to cover in this about cryptocurrency, but we can skip all of it. But cryptocurrency is just a um, simple uh, uh, currency that exists on a blockchain and they're exchanged completely digitally. Let's just keep it at that. And it's a digital currency that's secured by cryptography. Now, as you investigate, uh, if crypto is right for you and your business and all of it, you want to invest in it, you know, with all the kind of things that are going on in the market, you need to determine first our cryptocurrencies are legal in your country. And if they are, what regulation, regulation effects and so on. So each of them have their own pros and cons, but uh, there's also a new business. Uh, we've heard of uh, direct to customer, direct from farm, uh, business to consumer. There's also something called as direct to avatar, where businesses can sell digital products directly to their customers' representation. And then the next one that's big today is making a lot of money is uh, in-game currency with real money. And uh, you know you could even today, if you earn, let's say, uh, a rare shooting gun in 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 this uh, Call of Duty game, you could put it on sale and make real money, and someone else purchases it. So, I mean, those kind of thing, crazy things are going on. I know it's still a lot for a Web 2.0 brain to digest. Why, why is this generation doing all these kind of things? But it is what it is. We are on the other side. Um, if you're uh, over 35, and probably if you're on, under 30, all of this may be is making a lot of sense. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Talking about cryptocurrency, uh, it's secured by cryptography. Each cryptocurrency is introduced to the market with a white paper uh, describing the purpose and technology behind it. So if you're investing in it, go through the white paper uh, about it and properties coded into each type of crypto affect the volatility and potential of that currency. So conduct your due diligence by, by reading um, the white paper and third party analysis carefully before taking the plunge. Um, so I also see where we're over uh, you know, time, but um, you know, just about conducting the research, uh, take a look at Roblox Gucci Garden. You can purchase Gucci products on Metaverse and um, some of it. So think about what kind of presence you would like to have, who you would you like to reach. And uh, yeah, so this is about uh, how you would like to read. Uh, there's a lot of collaboration because you meet a lot of people and people would want ownership of uh, their data, allow customers to interact. Uh, that's about uh, the session. Uh, there's one just quick, so if anyone like to learn about it, uh, I've got a few resources that will quick you give you a, a good primer. Uh, since I being a, you know, a tech guy, uh, somebody who's a developer who wants to learn more, here are some of the courses that will get you started in less than a week and bring you up to speed on uh, certain things. So that's about it. Thanks guys, sorry I went slightly overboard. The, the, the topic uh, deserved a little bit extra, but uh, open for questions if there are any. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Maddie, for uh, that uh, wonderful uh, session. Yeah, I've, uh, I've missed a little bit, like the, the power went out really quick. So, Oh, can, can you tell uh, can you tell the the audience about the the project you have worked with NASA? I've read about that. Oh, okay. Yes, we're uh, launching um, a new satellite uh, which has a very um, hyperspectrometer uh, resolution, which is a world's first kind of a high resolution hyperspectrometer satellite that's going to uh, set a space. Its name is called a Pace. Um, and it's us going to low orbit in January 24th. Uh, so we are a research team. We are working on uh, collecting. Uh, there are 57 climate essential variables. We're collecting all of it, like, you know, all your biosphere data, stratosphere data, anthropogenic data, air quality, temperature, humidity, you know, snow cap melting in the Arctic to the floods and cloud movement and pressure and everything. And we're trying to trace them back to the sources as to who's causing what. 
Um, we're, our research is around air quality and extreme event attribution uh, because you know when your air pollution comes from emissions, emissions come from consuming energy. And because of air pollution, there's global warming. So we're tracing the whole thing and trying to come up with ways and action um, that we could do to try and see what we can do about uh, saving the planet from climate change. Perfect. Thank yeah. you so much for sharing yeah. that. Uh, there's a link, uh, Phil, there's a, a link that talks about all about what we're doing. Um, and I'm glad, you know, this whole company started from a personal story uh, of, you know, how um, my, my son who was six months old then uh, had tr trouble breathing and there was no data, there was no information, doctors was clueless. And somehow I put together a monitor, uh, an air, mon air monitor. And then one thing led to the other, we we're talking about measuring air quality across the whole world, across every street, measuring everything else in the environment, everything on the planet, every environmental data. And then we've become a, a major uh, you know, a movement today. Um, I'm glad NASA has recognized and we're working with them um, and trying to make certain things better for all of us. Perfect. And uh, we have some uh, few comments here from uh, Srini, mind blowing, from Ramya, complex topic made simple to understand. And I believe Sridhar has uh, questions. I'm good. I think uh, that was a great initiative, Anand. I would say, yeah. So, yeah, it's nice to know that. Yeah. Yeah, and Ramya, thanks. Uh, thanks for that, uh, Shida. Ramya shared um, a, a, a link that talks about uh, our base mission and association with NASA. Thanks, Ramya, uh, for sharing that. Thank you. And anyone else would like to ask questions or just share their insight? Yeah, just quickly, you know, if you have to travel as an alien in the metaverse and land on planet Earth, we'll be telling you how the environment is, how the water quality is, air quality is, whether will you live the next 50 years safely on where you stand or where your house is, or it's gonna, you're going to get drowned or run into drought. So that's the, that's the thing we're building. Uh, if it's for an individual, we're also building it for uh, companies and uh, uh, businesses and everyone who have to take action. If you have to sort of do business, you have to care for climate. And we're bringing this simulation, this reality, a simulated reality in the metaverse to make you know all those people who don't believe climate change is real, who, who don't know what to do about it, pointing them out in both showing the reality and helping them take action. So that's the metaverse application that we're building. And uh, we have here a question from Ravi. How will Metaverse help a software or a SAAS company? Any crazy ideas for a software company? Yeah, uh, thanks Ravi, funny you ask. Uh, I'm sure you already know um, with the question I can say, or, but I'm glad I made you think in that direction uh, from this session, but uh, um, there are plenty of things, you know, uh, you could uh, take up NLP, the simple, simplest of it is you could make a single metaverse. So people have trouble building metaverse, right? You build one uh, just like an API, right? People can use your API and integrate and into their own product, right? Let's say a weather API. Anybody can build a weather app if they have a weather API. So if you have a, 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 a bot that's trained on NLP, okay, it's, it's very conversational, but has an avatar configurable, brandable to a company's colors and logo and details, and language and everything, and, and they can adopt it, purchase it for you, give you a monthly subscription, and it could talk and address all of their customers' queries. And they could be, you know, it could handle 10,000 customers in, in any given minute. And that's, a, that's one of the ideas. And then there is a, a, a lot, and I mean, I could go on for SaaS, you know, if you're, it's a CRM, you know, there could be a metaverse that's actually helping customers engage, collect, data and generate leads from the customer, introduce the product. Instead of showing a demo video, you have a, a, a metaverse, you take your customers through a metaverse experience, explain them the product in a much better way, uh, in a, all in under one or two minutes. And they would feel much more appreciated. Uh, they would understand more and that could in, in, you know, convert a sale for a customer and you could build this as a product for a company. Um, you know, there could be a whole lot. I mean, you can take any product today, uh, any software product, 
that any of your favorite software product, there could be a metaverse angle to it. And that's as crazy as it can get. I hope that takes care of the uh, question, Ravi. And uh, we have here from Boana, great information. Yes, Ravi uh, called, uh, said thank you. Cool. And yeah. any more questions? Can we start? Uh, Srini, I cannot, uh, I do not have the uh, ability to stop the live. Uh, because uh, Maddie uh, Srini wanted to 